Hello everyone! Welcome on this windy Tuesday to Tech Tuesday. My name is Carrie Phillips. I am the Master Electrician here at Farmers Alley Theater. I am so excited to have these guests on tonight. I know that you're going to love everything that they have to say because they're so wonderful and they know so much about what they're talking about. So much more than I could even come up with questions to ask. I'm not even sure that was good English. Um, so if you would like to interact with our guests tonight, and I hope you do because they're wonderful, uh, you want to allow StreamYard to use your name. Uh, so you can do that by going to streamyard.com slash Facebook. That link is scrolling down below here. Um, so that way we can see your name. We can see who's asking questions. We can see who's showering our guests with praise. Um, we also want to make sure that you are liking, subscribing, following Farmer's Alley Theater on all of our many socials, so Instagram, Facebook, YouTube, Twitter, all of those, please like, subscribe, follow, um, and enjoy more Tech Tuesdays and more wonderful content with us as we go through this summer. Um, all right, I think we are uh, ready to introduce our guests. What do you think? Uh, so tonight is our, our music director edition. So we're gonna start with the University of Michigan Associate Professor of Musical Theater, Katherine Walker. We have, she has multiple titles, so give me a minute. Portage Central Middle and High School Director of Choirs and the Kalamazoo First Presbyterian Church Director of Music, Cindy Hunter. And joining us all the way from Maryland, we have uh, the most recent graduate from the University of Michigan, class of 2020, Cole Abbott. Hey everyone, thanks hello, for hello. joining us. We're so excited to have you here um, to talk a little bit about mm -hmm. what it's like to be a music director and deal with, you know, all of all of the divas, right? All of the divas. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so I wanted to, to start first and, and ask how all of you got involved with Farmer's Alley. Oh, hey, Kathy. <laughs> um, so Catherine, why don't you start? Oh, well, I was actually uh, involved in Farmer's Alley because uh, I was very close to the founders, all of them, actually. And then, of course, Kathy Mule, who just said hello. Uh, so I was uh, very interested in supporting the theater right out of the gate and have been on the advisory board from the very beginning. Awesome. And then of course did shows. So. <laughs> of course. <laughs> Cindy, what about you? Uh, I too had known all of the founders before the theater even opened. And my first uh, experience was playing keyboard when Erin Cassette music directed, She Loves Me. And we were actually perched on a loft backstage. Um, and then I moved into doing some music direction with Banicula and then Cabaret and Gypsy and most recently Camelot. Awesome. Cole, what about you? How did you, uh, how did you come to join the Farmer's Alley family? Miss Catherine Walker herself. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, it's, so it's her we have to blame is what you're saying. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, uh, Catherine was, uh, what was it? You were doing your second year in Thailand. Is that right? Yes. And, yeah. um, needed someone to fill her typical June spot and recommended me and I came in for fun home and the rest is history. So. Awesome. So do you have, do you have a favorite show that you've done at Farmer's Alley? I know fun home was just last year. The only one I've done. That's it. It was, well, I, was, I don't know. See, but you did the, uh, but I did the New Year's Eve, the New Year's Eve Koch yeah. family singers too. Yes. yes that's true. <laughs> <laughs> um, so Cindy, do you have a, a favorite that you've done at Farmer's or? Oh my gosh, I think I, I have two favorites. I think Cabaret back in 2014 was probably my favorite. Mm -hmm. And Catherine and I actually shared that show. Yes, we did. Uh, she got it on its legs and then I took over partway through the rehearsal process and did the performances as well. And then my most recent one, Camelot, I just loved the chamber version of that. And that was really special too. Yeah, that was beautiful. Um, Catherine, what about you? Do you have a favorite? Uh, you know what? I have favorites, so okay. it's it's Fair. kind of it's kind of <laughs> difficult. Uh, I would say um, Parade, Light in the Piazza, Next to Normal are way up there with my dog fight. I, you know what? <laughs> I love them all. 
<laughs> all, of, all of them are favorites for different reasons. Yeah, exactly. It's like, they're all such unique experiences. Show. I think you just fall in love with the show because you spend so much time with it, you know, and the people as well. So, mm -hmm. so do you have do you have a favorite part of the process from a music director? Like, do you do you like doing all the prep work and like learning the show ahead of time best? Do you really like working with the actors in rehearsals, working with the pit orchestra, working with sound designers. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> as we were talking about that earlier. Mm -hmm. um, for, I, you know, for me, the best part of the process is when it all is coming together. I love working on all aspects of the show, but that sort of magical time from the spacing of the show in the theater through tech and opening, is it's so exciting because everybody around you is in their element putting their piece of the pie in place and you watch the whole show come together like a drawstring <laughs> you know like pulling all the parts together i find that fascinating so cole what about you do you have a favorite part i've just i know you're fairly fairly new to music <laughs> directing <laughs> I, i've just always loved opening night like there's just a new energy and thrill and sometimes absolute fear, depending on the show. <laughs> panic. Uh, panic. But you know, the, the adrenaline's going, the, the, cr you just get all of a sudden you get the crowd energy and it, it just kind of changes everything. So I'm, I'm always going to be in love with opening nights and, and wanting to do show after show after show so I can get as many as I can. <laughs> A bit of an adrenaline junkie, should we oh, say? Oh, absolutely. <laughs> Cindy, what about you? I agree with Catherine. I, I love all the different parts for different reasons. For me, one of the most exciting moments, though, is the Zitz probe. And just seeing mm -hmm. the actor's response when they hear the orchestra for the first time. I think it's exciting for the orchestra. I think it's exciting for the cast. And then that just builds over Tech Week to opening night. Yeah, I, absolutely. I absolutely love working with the pit um, and really do enjoy playing the shows. So I'm one of those music directors that likes to take it from start to finish rather than turning yes. it over to someone else to conduct. Well, absolutely. yeah, the, Cindy and I were actually just talking about that the other day. Um, it doesn't happen very much in, in the professional world, but in the high school world, it's very common to have a different vocal person than you have actually conducting the show. And that is not usually a seamless transition unless it's the same person. Because when the same person is sitting in on choreography rehearsals, all the vocal rehearsals and staging, and then ultimately works with the band and conducts, there's a seamlessness that you, it's just impossible to get any other way. So that that is a challenge if you have to turn it over to somebody. Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. That absolutely makes sense. Um, so I wanna uh, focus on Cole for just a minute because you are a, a recent grad. Yes. Um, so you, are there things that you learned in your non-music classes that have sort of translated over to music or sort of helped shape you as a musician um, and as a leader of other musicians? Yeah, I mean, um, well, first of all, I so I also got an economics degree, so mm -hmm. it, it's just a whole different set of like hard, like hard numbers, skills, and that type of problem solving, which I think mm -hmm. then does kind of relate back to music directing when everything is, you know, there are certain moments when you're going through a score and it's a puzzle to figure out how to make it happen, and it, I think those problem solving skills do play well in both in both halves in both, both sides of the brain if you will um and i also just everything i've learned from all the you know the music history classes and the music theory classes which aren't like you know those aren't the piano skills and the conducting skills but still bringing that sort of knowledge and outside material into every show you know how figuring out how uh, you know, something from Rodgers and Hammerstein applies to something written by Pasek and Paul, you know? Th so even though those are music classes, it's still not exactly music directing class. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, absolutely. That's awesome. I hadn't even thought about like 
the, the math side of things and, and, mm. and how much math it actually takes to be a musician. Um, yeah. and, and how, n the more you know about math, the easier it makes your job as a music director. I had not, yes. had not considered that. I've not, I haven't <laughs> used like, you know, calculus in music right, directing, right. but <laughs> there's but, but, definitely but, some. Catherine's about to yeah, go ahead, well, I, I was tell just me how, say, ca I, how calculus helps my music. <laughs> no, 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 no. I was just going to say people that have struggled with reading music and literacy usually will tell you math was not their favorite topic. Like in their subject in school, they would not have picked math. People that are really strong in math usually will have a they have the understanding of subdivision and relate how the numbers relate because it really is math rhythm mm -hmm. is math it's it is a subdivision and... of it's sound it's sound divided up in any any number of infinite ways so so sort of sort of keeping in that same vein um cindy and Catherine, since you're both educators is there anything that you've learned um in your classrooms uh that has helped you with music direction or vice versa? Is there anything that you've learned like being a music director that has helped you um, in your classroom? And I know that you're both music teachers, so that makes it a little easier, yeah. um, a little more overlap there, but any any thoughts, Cindy, do you wanna? Sure, I'll yeah. start. Um, well, I think running a rehearsal is second nature to us. And we've learned over the years how to do it efficiently and, um, to the point where we don't even really have to think about it because you have to respond so quickly to what you're hearing um, and either make corrections or give affirmation or whatever. So I think uh, as a music educator, that really helps as a music director because um, we do that so easily as part of our music education job. And I also think um, I can certainly speak for Catherine's pits or excuse me Catherine's casts that because we're choral conductors we um we really can get our ensembles to sound fantastic it's it's one thing to work with your solo artists but mm. ensemble is really important and mm -hmm. i think we often get overlooked uh yep. in the rehearsal process so i really enjoy working with the ensemble and making it sound the best it can be yeah yeah here, here. Yeah, I think that uh, most people have a really strong sense of how to work with solo singers, but do not understand group dynamics and 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 a group sound. How to really nuance a group so that it has that electric impact to an audience. They don't necessarily know how to do that. And they don't know how to rehearse all those different parts. I think one of the key things is uh, time management that I use from the classroom. The ability yeah. to I'm constantly knowing what time it is. I know exactly how much time I'm going to spend on any given thing. I plan my rehearsals. Cole's laughing you know, <laughs> because I've been I in, in what four of your pit orchestras now, and I know oh, yeah. exactly what you mean. Yes. <laughs> I, I plan it down to the minute. I bank minutes. I borrow from myself. I have somebody timing me on everything, and and I can get done in a very short period of time. Something that you know others might struggle to do and I, I attribute that to being able to function in a very high pressure situation and that is public school teaching. I also think um, that you, you're even in the professional world you get people from all backgrounds, mm -hmm. all experience levels. You have to be a good problem solver which means that the first way you explained it is just the first. You better have nine other ways to explain what that issue is and how to solve it yeah. because because eventually you're going to use them all. So you need a very big bag of tricks and public school teaching helped me with, you know, with my duffel bag of tricks. <laughs> That's awesome. That's great. Yeah. Um, so, hey, everyone who's watching, uh, we would love for you to submit some, uh, let's, let's call them vocal myths. Or are they myths? Voice, voice we're going to play voice factor fiction here in just a little bit. So if you have any questions, any things uh, that you're curious about the voice that maybe you heard, maybe it's true, maybe it's not, maybe you just want to try and throw these fine folks a curveball. 
you know, I, we'll, we'll see. We'll see how it goes. So please uh, post down in the comments. Uh, let us know what you want to know. Um, I'm also going to take a moment here to brag about these folks for a minute. And I, I like to do this on Tech Tuesday because I think it's really fun. I think that um, especially those of us who spend more time behind the scenes than on the stage, um, I, I, you know, we're not always great at, at bragging about ourselves. We're not always great at saying, hey, look at this awesome thing that has happened to me or this awesome thing that I've done. Um, you know, we're, we're, we're not on stage for a reason, right? We, we're behind the <laughs> scenes because we, we like to be part of the team and part of the support. Um, but, uh, but, but these folks have done some pretty cool things. So I'm going to start with Cole. As he mentioned, uh, Cole graduated from Michigan this year with two degrees. And it took him four years to do two degrees. Um, and I feel like that's pretty unheard of these days. Uh, I'm not sure that I could have done uh, one degree in four years. So, <laughs> so congratulations, Cole. That is definitely something worth bragging about. <laughs> um, now, Miss Cindy has a brand new granddaughter who is three weeks old, three and a half probably now since you sent me since you sent me that email, um, and. She also has a 10 month old granddaughter and an almost four year old grandson. So that is also definitely something to brag about. If, if I had pictures, I would probably try to have Tony put some pictures up right now, but we don't have pictures. So it's fine. Um, and Catherine recently taught musical theater at Mahidon University in Thailand for a three week residency and, and, was published in two books with articles on vocal pedagog ped pedagog Pedag pedagogy oh pedagogy I, I literally I just struggle with that word so much I wrote it phonetically in my notes too and I still couldn't write it so there we go <laughs> so yes that all three of these wonderful people have many many things to brag about many things that's not, that's not even the tip of the iceberg. So as Kathy said, we'll singing. Oh, here we go. We have an audience question. Uh, ah. John wants to know, will singing and studying classical repertoire make it more difficult for me to sing musical theater? Anybody um, want to start? I'd love to, can I take that? <laughs> Absolutely, <laughs> Catherine, go for it. Uh, only if that's all you do. Because, for example, if I take ballet for 10 years, I'm going to be an awesome ballerina, but I'm probably not going to be a very good tapper. So if I want to do ballet and tap, I have to study both. If I want to do classical voice, opera, and I want to do musical theater or pop singing, it is totally possible. Um, it is a myth that you can't do both. You really just have to train the muscles and the understanding of the voice very clearly for each style. That, that's what I've come to discover in, in, my, in the last 10 years of really studying voice with some really great people. Well, let's, let's jump into uh, some voice factor fiction then. All righty. This, the, this is the fun part, right? We were talking about this beforehand too. Um, so we're going to start right off. Uh, fact or fiction, dairy is bad for your vocal cords. What do you say? Who wants to? I'll jump in. <laughs> I will say it can be. It depends how you react to dairy. For many people, they find that when they eat cheese or drink milk or eat ice cream and then try and sing, that there's a buildup of phlegm and... Um, that that makes it more difficult to sing. For some people, I think Cole mentioned this, that he hasn't noticed yeah. really that it is a no, problem. It does happen to I me, think, but I haven't heard it from anyone else. <laughs> I, thought I, was I think you just have to know your own voice. <laughs> mm -hmm. And if it if it has that impact on you, then stay away from it. Catherine, you had also. Had yeah, there's a little that. bit of a viscosity issue. In other words, it, it can make the saliva a little, it can. 
make the saliva a little thicker. So even if you don't have a dairy reaction, it can actually make the, oh, it's almost like the saliva becomes sluggish. Because obviously when you're eating, you're not really in touch with your vocal folds. I really the hope food no is not really dinner. Well, <laughs> it's not really vocal folds, but what it is, what it is doing is affecting all of the tissues. So if you, uh, if you eat something, you know, gargle, clear it out, brush your teeth, just kind of neutralize that response. And, and then if you do react to it, just don't have it, but it's not a general rule. I think in general, water is your best friend. <laughs> yep. <laughs> um, ice cream substitutes, right? Not not dairy ice cream, but non-dairy ice cream. Well, there you go. There you go. <laughs> um, so Nat had Nat had a question that popped up here. Uh, he said, okay. "Must know, is it true? Snapping on one and three is the hidden secret to swing music." Asking for a friend. <laughs> you're, you're I, will say. I, I want Cole to do that yeah. one. I want yeah. Let me tell you, as, as much as it sounds like so not hip, Benny Green, master of swing, who I studied with for two wonderful years at the university, had me practice with not snapping on one and three, but with, with a metronome on one and three when I was swinging, even though it's like against the backbeat because it helps get your time in shape. So even though it's it's a little, you know, it makes it sound a little square, it is a good way to practice mm -hmm. when you're swinging to try to make sure you're internalizing the rhythm on both one and three and two and four. So right. yeah, we can call it the hidden secret. <laughs> well, yeah, I think it's lining up, it's lining up your time. Right. So if you set a metronome on one and three, and then the metronome is on one and three, you're on two and four internally, you're, right. you are squaring up your time. Mm -hmm. And that's what everybody's always looking for is good time. I mean, when you get a drummer with good time, you rehire them over and over again. It's all about the, <laughs> it's all about the good time. We're yeah, all the good for a good time. <laughs> and feeling that offbeat is so important, subdividing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I was a horn player in high school. I was in marching band for six years. And if, if anyone learns how to play an offbeat, it's a horn player, right? right. So that every time they hand out a, <laughs> right. You know, and every time they hand out a march, you roll your eyes and the flute players are giddy with joy. Mm -hmm. So, but I remember clicking in my throat on one and three and playing on two and four. So I, that I trained myself to have good off, off beats or two and four mm -hmm. by training the beat in my throat. All right. All right. It was the same thing that Nat was referring to. Yeah. I still do it when I play. Sometimes I click my tongue on two and four to, to give myself some extra groove. Yeah. It'll, I mean, it's, yeah. it's gotta have a good time. Mm -hmm. oh, yeah. Gotta have a good time. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, good time is a good time. That's what <laughs> I like that. We should make t-shirts. So. Farmer, Farmer's Alley Theater. Good time is a good time. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> All right. Next up in voice factor fiction, uh, and we're this is sort of overlap with what we what we talked about a, a minute ago. Rock singers do more damage to their voices than musical theater performers or classical singers. Catherine, Can you want to that one, everybody? You, 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 yeah. you want to give us a little anatomy? Go for it. A little anatomy yeah. lesson. Well, you know, first of all, there are just as many classical singers in every voice clinic in this country as there are pop, rock, and contemporary. I mean, they're just they're just are. Um, the 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 trick is to sing any style healthfully, which means that you use as little pressure and constriction as possible to make the sound. So. You, you have to learn you have to learn that belting is not just screaming high and if you're gonna if you're going to sing like sort of a high rock cry there are ways to do that healthfully there are ways to add all all of the effects that they use without gripping and stripping your voice so there there are there are many, many healthy ways to sing contemporary music. And there are lots of people in the classical world that find themselves in a voice clinic for vocal fatigue. So it, the, the voice is a very, very delicate mechanism. So it can be disrupted by any style of music. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, 
Mm -hmm. Truly. Yep. Anybody want to add anything or no? Was it, was, was a good answer. It was a pretty complete answer. Yeah. yeah. I, I was just going to say like in terms of, uh, you know, if, you, if you're a singer wanting to get hired, like having that versatility, going back to the previous question too, it's just like mm -hmm. having that ability to do both, you're going to be able to be a working actor. So. Well, and I think people used to get hired in a, in a niche, you know, yeah. you, you had your Barbara cooks that that's the only thing that they did and they got hired all the time. And the industry has changed so much that you really have to be everything. You have to be able to go in for light in the piazza, you know, rock of ages, come from away. She loves me on a dime mm -hmm. and true for the dance courses as well. So, I mean, yeah. they just have to be very versatile. Yeah. It's a lot of work. <laughs> yep. Yep. All right. Next factor fiction. Warming up is always necessary, no matter how old you are or how long you've been singing. Absolutely, I think. It's, and it's knowing how to warm up. Right. And warm down, cool down. Cool mm -hmm. down, yep. Yeah, mm -hmm. and I think that's a part that we often don't allow time for. Right. Um, and I think warming up is as much a physical as it is a mental focus for what you're about to do. It's frequently non-singing as well. Right. You can frequently get your body ready as a track star would by stretching and preparing. There are so many non-vocal things that you can do. And usually people go right to running scales and arpeggios, which is really technique development, not necessarily warming up. Um, and then with regards to the cool down, they've done all kinds of uh, studies to say muscle recovery is improved by as much as 35% if you do a cool down after an activity. So I think that's really important to remember. So if you do a high vocal load activity, such as a rehearsal, a gig, something like that, it's really best to cool down doing the opposite of what you did in the event. So if you were singing really, really high, then do some lo you know low, quiet sirens, 10, 15 minutes, just to kind of get the voice to rebalance so it's there for you tomorrow. Okay. I don't think that's something I was ever taught. Thank you. <laughs> well, most, most people don't cool down. They, mm -hmm. they really don't. They, they think of, oh, I'm, thank goodness I'm done. Or they'll say, I'm really tired. I'm going to be on vocal rest till tomorrow, which is a good idea sometimes, but cool down first. <laughs> mm -hmm. It makes sense. It makes sense. <laughs> All right, we have one more voice factor fiction. Uh, singing releases endorphins and burns calories. I sure wish it burned calories. <laughs> it, bur it, burns more calories than, like, it burns more calories than sleeping, right? <laughs> I have to look this one up. I will go with the endorphins on this because I can go to a rehearsal feeling upset about something or sad or tired. And I start that rehearsal and by the end of the night, I couldn't have told you what I was bothered by when I walked in. Mm -hmm. It's my life is transformed through the rehearsal process and making music. So I'm going with the endorphins. Absolutely. But if the calories are true, that's great. <laughs> <laughs> it certainly can't hurt, right? right. <laughs> yep, yep. I mean, they say they say that knitting burns calories, so That's I can't great. imagine why singing doesn't. <laughs> Amy and I were talking about this question earlier today, and and so I actually looked it up, and the body actually releases dopamine and serotonin when you sing, and that's the pleasure that you feel mm -hmm. from it. Mm -hmm. And I know for a fact, every Thursday night when I'm at church choir and it's toward the end of the week and I'm tired and uh, I'm not sure I want to do one more rehearsal, I always feel energized at nine o'clock when it's over. Yep. Yep. And I feel that way with, you know, any rehearsal, my students, a yep. Farmer's Alley rehearsal. Mm -hmm. And I think, you know, people that enjoy doing this as a profession or as a hobby, that's part of why. I mean, if they didn't enjoy it, they wouldn't be doing it. Yep. Right? <laughs> exactly. They I hope not. <laughs> All right. Well, that's all we've got for voice factor fiction. So thank you for playing Mythbusters. <laughs> um, we had a question from Cam Taylor. 
who is a wonderful local musician. And he asked, um, what advice would you give to musicians that are interested in playing in a pit orchestra? Oh. Um, do it. I mean, actually, <laughs> no, no, I'm serious. Okay. Get, get involved whenever, you know, you know, make yourself known to people that are music directors. I've gotten many an email that'll say, hey, I'm so-and-so. I'm a student in the School of Music, Theater, and Dance, and I would really like to be considered for the next show. And so we sort of keep an Excel document that we write down people's names and, and then, you know, word of mouth is also good. So if you can mm -hmm. volunteer somewhere and then somebody else recommends you, you never know how these names get passed around, but they do. It's a small community. Even, even when you're in a big city, this, this thing we do is a rather small closed community in some ways. And so you'd be surprised who's connected, which is why you want to always play nice. <laughs> it's true. true. It's true. Yeah. Um, so, so outside of like networking, is there anything like technically um, that that people should well, be working get on? To I know guess shows they should they should learn some rep because that helps a lot. Mm. When you when you're sitting in a show and you've never listened to the music and you don't, you know, it's really hard to kind of get get in that group. So I'd say see a lot of shows. And then, um, I don't know, Cindy, Cole, I, what are your thoughts? I think listening to a lot of shows and I think um, working on your sight reading skills and being yeah. willing to not be a timid player mm. because um, yeah. oftentimes you don't have a lot of orchestra rehearsals before you're with the cast and <laughs> uh, you need to jump right in. And as Cam says, always have a concert. <laughs> For for those that have worked with Mark Tomlinson over the years, he's a wonderful bass player yes. and friend who I've worked with since I don't want to tell you how many years ago. <laughs> I remember one day he came in and he handed me a pencil that he had had made that he was giving out to all his friends. And it Aww. says, every good musician has a pencil. May I borrow yours? <laughs> 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 I never like a Mark gift. <laughs> <laughs> um, the other thing that I was going to add to that, Cindy, were you still going? Sorry. No, go for it. Okay. Um, I think like for me, what helped me get into the pit orchestra scene, because like that's how I got into music directing. I think a lot of people come from either choir or performing, and I totally came from the pit orchestra route, was like fluency of styles. The fact that I had played both classical and jazz music growing up was a huge thing because I had the groove from the jazz side and I had the sight reading chops from the classical side. And right. so being able to, you know, play a bunch of different styles will help, you know, get, yeah. get gigs, get different shows. So that way you can be hired for Legally Blonde and Pirates of Penzance in the same <laughs> time, right? Yeah, exactly. And, and that's the same for singers. Right. Yeah. And, and, uh, and I also think, I think Cindy's point about sight reading is really, really valid. I think one of the tough, tough things for high school kids when they sit in a pit for the first time is to read the keys and the number of the amount of chromaticism and the number of accidentals that you run across and that you have to be a, a massive error detector because never have any of us done shows where it's perfect. Never, I've never done a perfect show, meaning that there's always a problem somewhere in somebody's book, and you, they have to use their ear to say, "Hey, I think that maybe is an E flat there. I'm playing against the flute, and it doesn't sound right." And mm -hmm. they have to, they have to kind of learn to, to, to be that, to be that uh, confident and and use their reading skills. And the rhythms are always challenging for uh, younger players. Right. It's tricky. I have one more thing too to add to that. I think um, more and more and more the read books are increasingly difficult oh, in terms oh my of gosh. The expectation yeah. of the number of instruments you need to yep. be able to play. So yep. I would, and I've had the luck of working with a number of excellent saxophonists, clarinetists at Portage Central. And that is our biggest advice to them is learn to play more than one instrument and you will yeah. get hired. Uh, yeah. You learn to play the flute, even if you're a reed player. Yeah. Um, 
Yeah. So, yeah. Well, Cam, that's not that's not something I'm sure you need to worry about because well, but Cam is really good at Cam um, can play everything. Cam's hard for everything. Everything. <laughs> all these different guitar styles and mm -hmm. guitar drums. The same thing. You He's need also to know a drummer. To play one kind of guitar. Mm -hmm. Right. Right. And then if you're a drummer, even better. <laughs> right. right. <laughs> so uh, Jeremy asked. Uh, do pop singers have a better technique now than they did 50 years ago? I feel like it depends on the singer, right? Yes, and I also think we know a lot more about the voice. And I think, mm -hmm. you know, if we go back to the 19th century, to Garcia, and when he was looking down people's throats with a, you know, sunlight and a dental mirror, I mean, that, what are you going to see, you know? Mm -hmm. And then it wasn't until the the 80s, basically, when we could begin more sophisticated stroboscopies, which we now do with regularity. And because of that, we have learned a whole lot about how the mechanism works. So yes, I, I do think, especially if they've had training, and then there's also a place for them to go. So if people haven't had training and they get themselves in trouble, they can they can seek out a voice clinic that can really see what's mm -hmm. going on and get rehabilitation. I mean, you know, Adele was rehabilitated. She was off the grid for a while because she got herself in some trouble and and uh, and had to kind of learn to do things again in a safer way. So yeah. So I, I yes, they absolutely have better technique. Yeah. Um, so is there anything that you wish more people knew about being a music director? Cindy, do you wanna? You yeah. you smiled, and so I kind of. <laughs> I thought about this one in advance too. I think what a lot of people don't realize um, is the challenge in many theaters when you're not in a conventional pit right in front of the stage. For instance, at Farmer's Alley, we're often backstage mm -hmm. or in the green room. Mm -hmm. and just, um, the, the dependence on the sound person and you know, making sure that you can hear what's going on. You have a video monitor, and they can see and hear the orchestra in the performance room. I I, I think it's it's magical that it works, and I think people <laughs> don't think about it because it just seems like it's magic. But there really is um, there are a lot of challenges inherent in that, and it's mm -hmm. it is very cool when it all comes together. So. I also think that people people think that when they go to a show that what they're hearing, everything of what they're hearing is written down. And that's just not true. Um, mm -hmm. Especially today where you have all these scenery tracking in and, and out and flying and whatnot, there's almost no transition music most of the time. So if you're in a situation where you have to create transition music, you are making edits and cuts for the choreographer, you're changing keys, you are, um, I, I mean, some of my fondest memories are when Kathy will say, I feel like we need music here with Kathy <laughs> Ulay, for, for everybody knows who I'm talking about. And so and I'm like, I'll always be like, Kathy, just give me a minute. And I just have to go away and think about the scene and then come up with something for her. So, or in, in Cabaret, for example, there was, uh, you know, there are multiple versions. Well, which version are you doing? Sometimes you end up pulling from a different version. Or I created a men's chorus in um, the Tomorrow Belongs to Me in Cabaret, the one that Cindy worked on, because it seemed like a good idea. So we created this little chorus. And so, there's a lot of writing, arranging, and changing that goes on that people have no idea what we do. And then ultimately, the show rides on two people, the stage manager and the music director. Mm -hmm. If those two people are not on their A game, that show will fall apart. And if something does go awry, those two people are gonna save your bacon. And it so is very I, true. <laughs> and I do not think people realize that they have no idea how much weight is on your shoulders when that when that show kicks off, you feel it. You know that you have to be on your A game for two and a half hours or longer in some cases. And and you have to be prepared for anything to happen. Exactly. And there's a lot a number of things. And a lot can, can happen. Wrong. Yeah. Yes. Another thing, theater. Another thing is, um, especially in a theater the size of Farmer's Alley, 
um, oftentimes it's up to the music director to figure out how they're going to reduce the orchestration because yeah. it might be orchestrated for 15 instruments or 20 instruments or nine instruments and you're budgeted six. So what can you play with live musicians and what are you going to have to cover in another book? And I know the people that I tend to hire, um, they're just so used to me saying, okay, um, so and so can you're going to take this part and you know when we take a break I'm going to copy it and you're going to stick that in your score and you're going to cover the the oboe solo because we don't have an oboe and they just get used to that and we have amazing musicians to work with that are so really do. <laughs> flexible and I adore them for that they just yes they expect the unexpected and I think they rise to the challenge yep absolutely um cool since since you're still fairly new to being a music director, is there anything that you wish you knew before beforehand? Like anything that has really surprised you as you've been been learning how to do this? Anything that? Oh gosh, uh, I <laughs> think I wish I had liked being in choir as a kid. I think that would have helped <laughs> so Fair. much along the way, or at least liked it more. I did like it, but I never continued it. Um, I think that would have been something that would have been just so beneficial to me but i'm you know learning the ropes on that sort of thing and and mm -hmm. figuring all that out um i don't know i've gotten such good advice from from catherine and the other professors at u of m i don't think they've steered me too wrong as far as i know <laughs> I hope not. <laughs> I hope not. um so so i you know i think the the last four years were just such a learning experience and and Every time I think I know how to solve such and such problem, I run into something else that I haven't figured out yet. And I'll, I'll give Catherine her a call and she'll, she'll help me out. <laughs> yeah. It's always great to have, have those people in your back pocket. Oh yes. Who are, are willing to accept a phone call and uh, share their knowledge. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, so Adam had a question that popped up here. Um, he said, what advice can we give choral and music directors for moving forward in the era of COVID-19? Are we destined to shun group singing until a vaccine is created? Well, okay, right out of the gate, the, you know, one of the issues that, that we have is the latency issue. So you, you can't sing live where like, for example, if, if Cole's trying to play and I'm trying to sing with him, we, we can't make that happen mm -hmm. at this point, right? So I think there are gonna be more and more virtual events where people have the tracks and you know all of the things that we see on Facebook where you see these choirs singing, that's how they're doing it. You know, they have, they have something in their ear, they have a click or a track that they're working with and they're singing along with it. Um, so I think we'll see more of that. And I also think there's gonna be a lot of social distancing. I think smaller ensembles for a while, I think you're gonna see uh, octets and maybe groups of 16, but I think massive choirs are probably gonna take a little bit of a break, which it could be interesting because we could be creating new work that's that's gonna emerge out of this time. Who knows? So. Yeah. I don't know, Cindy, what are your thoughts? I mean, you're, you're in the agree. trenches here. Um, with my church job, initially, we've been doing virtual performances that we record in advance in the sanctuary with just a soloist and the piano. Um, the last couple of weeks, we've ventured into quartets, um, either singing or a handbell quartet. But I, I'm not comfortable going larger than that at this yeah. point. One thing I wanted to point out about what you said about virtual choirs is, Yes, they're all singing with click tracks, but they're not at the same time. Those recordings are right. downloaded into mm -hmm. uh, and a edited, oh, right. and compiled. Yeah, that in and of itself takes hours and hours. So it's not yes. the finished product is not a live performance, and I think that's a common no. misconception. Right, is that people are all singing together at the same time. Mm -hmm. I I imagine a lot of music directors and choir directors are suddenly finding different skill sets that they're, you know, wh whether it's, you know, if a choir director doesn't have someone to do the video editing for them or they're learning to use digital audio workstations, right? I imagine that there are a lot of people figuring all those things out. And I imagine that there are a lot of, what I've, what I've been doing is kind of doing my own 
creative work that's not ensemble based and exactly. trying to, I've been doing writing, I've been um, working on my own piano skills, those sorts of things. And, you know, I, it's probably good that we're all getting, get, ganging up on our practice a little bit. And Well, I think it's forcing us to think outside the box and, Absolutely. Um, you know, just like even at Portage Central, I'm thinking of ways if we're still socially distanced in the yeah. fall um, of doing an online cabaret or something like that, where um, it could be live like we are right now in this format, but just with an individual and a track, mm -hmm. as opposed to trying to do um, choral singing. Has there been a lot of discussion in the, just because I'm not in this circle, like has the education world been prepping and trying to figure this out? Yeah. Oh yeah, I've well, been on a yeah. lot of webinars um, about this. In fact, there was a third one tonight sponsored by American Choral Directors Association and NATS, Nas National mm -hmm. Association of Teachers of Singing. And a couple of weeks ago, we were on one um, with some people in Germany and there, there was a guy in Berlin that's part of an organization that's trying to develop uh, an online platform where you actually can sing simultaneously and you don't get the latency issue. And it's called Digital Stage. So keep your eyes out for that. They're hoping to be able to roll that out this summer. Yeah, that would be awesome. <laughs> and there's well, other... there are a number of them. There's Jam Jamulus and Jam Kazam, and they're all trying. I'll tell you, whoever there's gets a lot their of first, trying. yeah, uh, whoever mm -hmm. gets there first, it's going to do well. <laughs> mm -hmm. But it also, I feel like it also has the potential to be helpful for the singers um, because if they are working in smaller groups, then they can potentially get a little more attention and they can um, they have the opportunity to work more on their own instrument um, in a smaller setting as opposed to in a large choral setting. Right. right. And they can't so, hide in an ensemble. Yeah. <laughs> right. <laughs> well, I think it'll help build the more independent singers. Mm -hmm. well. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, so I, definitely I, some positives. I think there's going to be a lot of innovation in, in our field. I think, you know, there's just bound to be. People aren't gonna just stop doing what they're doing right now. There's right. Just, there's gonna be people who are coming up with really creative ways with all the technology we have at our disposal. Mm -hmm. Wanna make sure everybody keeps getting that dopamine. Well, art is fundamental. I mean, it, it's how we yep. tell our story. It, you know, it, it's funny, I remember a friend of mine who used to teach drama in Gull Lake, um, so he was sort of down one day and I ran into him and I, I looked at him and I said, you know, I don't teach in the performing arts because I want everybody to become a professional. And even though a lot of my students become professionals, they don't all, mm -hmm. right? Um, I, really, I really teach in the performing arts because I want to live in a more empathetic world. I want to make the world a better place by teaching people to be sensitive. And I, you know, I can speak for Cindy, she and I are about the same place in our careers, you know, and we need people to replace us. So thank you, Cole. <laughs> <laughs> We're really happy you're here and all the young music directors that see the value in making and creating art. So we just have to keep doing it. Exactly. I think, you know, what we've seen in our world in the last couple of weeks yep. um, has been oh, yeah. that, um, music has a place in creating change. And yep. I'm really, um, really pondering that right now, how I can use my musical skills to make a difference in the world. Not that it doesn't in teaching or it doesn't in theater, of course it does, but to make a social, to make a different social change. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know. I think there's a place for that right now. Well, there's a wonderful organization called Playing for Change that uh, my husband Tom found, and I highly recommend you check it out. Okay. So it's I'm writing basically it that idea, Playing for Change. That's awesome. We should uh, put that put that link in the comments too. We'll find there it for you, you and we'll put that link okay. in the comments, everyone. Okay. Playing for Change. Um, well, I think that is a really wonderful sentiment to sort of go out on this evening. So thank you so much, everyone, for joining us, for your comments, for your questions, for your appreciation of these three wonderful musicians. Um, thank you to Tony Mitchell, our producer, for taking care of everything behind the scenes. 
and for also being a, a wonderful, wonderful sound designer for Farmer's Alley. Um, it's very hard to uh, be a music director without a competent sound designer. So we are very, very lucky to have Tony on our team. <laughs> Um, thank you to Catherine and to Cindy and to Cole for hanging out tonight and for sharing some wisdom and some secrets and uh, and your time and your clear love for what you do with us. Um, everyone, My please pleasure. make sure you are liking, following, subscribing all of Farmer's Alley socials. Um, up, coming up next, we have a... Uh, cast reunion on Sunday night. We are doing a cast reunion for It Should Have Been You. So if you saw that show and you want to reconnect with the cast, please join us. Um, or even if you didn't see that show and you just want to meet some cool people, uh, join us Join us too. Um, yeah, thank you all again for joining us. And yes, three amazing musicians slash educators slash humans. Julie is absolutely right. Oh, so thank you everyone for being here. Thank you, Carrie. Thank you so Thank much. Thank you. Carrie. Beautiful job, Carrie. Thank you. <laughs> and I will see everyone next time on Tech Tuesday. <laughs> Bye. <laughs>